and it gives me a pleasure to introduce Odile Eisenstein, the center, National Center in Research Scientific. She, Odile was elected as the president of the International Academy of Quantum Molecular Science, a very distinguished body of international scientists established by De Broglie. And we are really looking forward to the presentation on a different world, but it's complementary and supplementary. No black holes, I guess. No black holes. But we shall listen eagerly to the presentation on chemistry, the color of the universe. Thank you very Please, much, Joshua. Okay. Uh, thank I would like to thank you, the uh, Israeli Academy of uh, Science and Humanities for this invitation. I'm delighted to be here. And as you are going to see, my talk is uh, rather different from any, anyone else. I have actually taken something which is a bit why chemistry is fun, even if you actually may not have been coming from that at the very beginning. So let's start with actually the f reason why chemistry is quite different from any other science. The French chemist in the last century, in the last millennium, actually mentioned that chemistry creates its own object. So it does not observe object, it also creates its own object. And because it creates its own object, it's related to art. So we are going to see indeed that chemistry is incredibly informative on many, many aspects. It is actually a science which fits beautifully the topic of the symposium, Science Without Border, because itself chemistry can affect, touch, inform, and basically explain so many things through so many art topics. So let's take actually with the very beginning. In fact, the name of chemistry is really not really known. Historians of art and of chemistry have actually proposed that it may come from the Egyptian word black. Interestingly, black hole, no, no. Why black? Actually black from the black soil of the Nile Valley. We may see a little, you know, one or two transparency why this name has been given or may have been given. It actually more probably also comes from the Greek, which is actually meaning to pour. Why to pour? Because there is a lot of liquid at the time where actually people were doing, I mean, were creating this science. In fact, it was not really a science at the very beginning. The, among the first experiments were done, were done in China, where hemp was transformed into uh, paper. But I am absolutely sure that Chinese people at that time didn't have the conscience that they were chemists. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the reason is that chemistry was focused on two topics, trying to make life eternal and trying to make gold. So they make elixir for life, but unfortunately this elixir was actually made of mercury, sulfur, and arsenic, having a consequence on the emperor of China to have eternal life very quickly. <laughs> and philosophical stone, indeed, was never made, despite many attempts. Interestingly, it is this part of the world that Maria Hebrae, actually in French called Marie la Juive, created something which is a water bath, which in French is actually called Bain Marie. So we explain the word more precisely. Zosim, in, uh, in also the early time, realized something very important. Color may be indicated of something. And he created, he actually saw that black, black, white, yellow, and purple were essential. Why? Don't know, but color was important. He also actually created distillation. So with that in mind, we are going actually to explore and present a few cases where you are going to see how chemistry can be informative. This was mentioned by Catherine. This is actually the beautiful painting in the Grotte de Lascaux at made 20,000 years ago. Where you say, well, this is not chemistry. No, it's not chemistry, it's art. I agree. But any of you knows how to actually find those pigments in nature? 
How many of you know how to fix them on the wall? I don't know how many of you will go outside and pick the pigment and put that on their own and they will fail. So they were clearly chemists without knowing they were chemists. They didn't have the conscience to be chemists. This is a very interesting case of chemistry, <laughs> which was solved only recently. There was black cosmetic used in Egypt to cure <coughs> eye infection and actually skin ailments. And when that was analyzed, it's essentially made of lead-based compounds. As we know, lead is poisonous. But those people were actually not killed. They seem to have been cured, or at least they were not reported being dead, which is indeed quite different, I agree. However, recently, there was a very precise uh, experiment done, trying first of all to reproduce, indeed, and analyze the compound. The compound is made of several, actually, uh, uh, compounds made of, of lead, including two which were really synthesized at the time, at that time, which is incredible that new compounds were could be made. And they were actually shown to have medical efficiency. So why were they not poisonous? Because, in fact, they were so little soluble that only a little bit of the water of the eyes was actually putting some of this lead into, into the, the body. And therefore, in fact, they were indeed, med they had medical efficiency without killing the person. The most, one of the most famous painting of all. Why do I show that? Is that chemistry? Let's focus on two aspects of this painting. One aspect of this painting. You see from here to here, you don't see a border. There is no border. From here to here, you don't see a border. There is no border. You go smoothly from the skin to another part of the skin, from the skin to the hair. This is called sfumato, because it looks like a smoke going from one part of the painting to the other. How do you make smoke with something which is purely opaque? Paint is opaque. You are not going to see through painting. So that was analyzed. But how do you analyze the most pre one of the most precious paintings of all? So when, uh, when the scientist, Philippe Walter, went to the Louvre and asked, I want to do an experiment of La Joconde, you can imagine the scream of the, of the uh, director. Non, absolutely non-invasive method needs to be used, and it is for only spectrometry. It was able to show that this fumato was not made of the spent was made of four layers of panting. Each one of the thickness of 0, 0, 0.05 millimeter. White, pink, dark, to see through, and varnish. And each of those was so thin that in fact it's almost nanochemistry. Leonard da Vinci was a master of nanochemistry without conscience. <laughs> Some were much less lucky. Using a varnish was quite well known in, in uh, art. And as you see, <coughs> the forehead of that woman is completely destroyed. Interestingly, this varnish is actually made of bitume, which is a kind of something you put on the road. Mm -hmm. How do you actually view that? Of course, it was dissolved in a solvent, but turned out actually to destroy the painting. And one of the other most famous paintings from Rembrandt, which is actually look like very, very dark, should have been actually much brighter if it had not been destroyed by the varnish, which was supposed to protect the painting. So there was clearly a problem of controlling the chemistry. Van Gogh, Van Gogh, the king of yellow. But Van Gogh was a mad guy. There was many reasons. Van Gogh was a mad guy. He was drinking too much. Uh, he was, I don't know if he was eating too much. I don't know if he had sex also. <laughs> but he was not conscious of being so mad, maybe. Why? Because all of the yellow painting is actually poisonous. Lead, arsenic, and lead. So if ever 
which is very often when you are you don't have any water, you just started leaking your pant, your, you may be poisoned by lead. There is some text proposing that as an addition to all of the other problem he had. Sometimes chemistry can help you. This guy, Parmentier, was a pharmacist. At the time he was working, which was just before the French Revolution, pharmacists and chemists were the same tool. I mean, there was no border between chemistry and pharmacy, and many other sciences, in fact. And it turned out that because he was a military, he had been actually in jail, and he was taken by the German, and he had to eat potatoes. Because in fact, potatoes were not known in the north of France, but they were already imported in Germany at that time. And he thought that was kind of nourishing, not very good, but was kind of nourishing. And he was trying to say, what can I do for France? Because at that time, there was, a, there was a, uh, an immense problem for finding food. So what he did, because he knew that there was no way he could convince anybody to eat boiled potatoes, he tried to extract the starch from the potatoes. And he actually made bread with, from potatoes without any flour. That time just before the French Revolution. In fact, he saved the north of France from starvation. And actually, one point is that chemistry and food can be fun, not necessarily enemies, as we often say. And it is absolutely true that there is something called actually molecular gastronomy. How, what is molecular gastronomy? <coughs> molecular gastronomy is actually trying to make food by understanding the physical property of the food and trying to deconstruct and reconstruct new food. So this mayonnaise doesn't have egg at all and because you can use other ingredients. This looks like flour, but I don't know what it is made of, but it is actually completely different origin. This is probably made of a very light material. I don't know what it is, but those two dishes have been actually put or been offered into one of the most expensive restaurants of the world in Spain. Now, again, conscience is there, eating going there is probably attracted by the beauty and the taste of this unusual food made by chemistry, molecular gastronomy. Well, I'm going to go very quickly on the fact that chemistry was become a science around the French Revolution. And one of the key persons is, of course, Lavoisier, who, as you know, discovered oxygen, lost his head, not because he was a chemist, but because he turned out to be a tax collector and he was beheaded because he was therefore dealing with money at that time. One of the things we should actually realize, and it's amazing, is that in the, from 1700 till to basically the beginning of uh, last century, only a limited number of uh, elements were known out of the 118 elements now reported by Ayupa. So there was quite a few holes in the periodic table. Now, as you all know, Mendeleev created the periodic table. I am not surprised that Mendeleev created the periodic table. What I'm surprised is the fantastic foresight. He actually agreed that there was missing elements. He did not only take elements he knew, he actually saw that there was possible prediction for new elements. And I think this is an incredible ability to foresee something. And indeed, by just, oops, oops, sorry, by just using weight as a criteria, and we know that it is not going to be the modern criteria, it was enough to actually order the known element and predict that there may be elements in between. To be noted, and I found remarkable, it's written in French, as you know, all Russian at that time were speaking French fluently. Now, we all know, and this is a bit of a joke, of course, we all know what is now the driving force for chemistry. 
in, in its own link, the electron. The electron make all of the difference between different elements. Now, if you are not a chemist, if you're not a scientist, if I tell you that you have carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen differing only by one electron, you forget you, you learn already all about it. And you say that from carbon, you make methane, which is you use for burning. This is indeed, as you know, cows <laughs> emit a lot of methane, and this is the direct use of a cow in a house to, to uh, just as a, as a cartoon. Ammonia, one electron more nitrogen, and use an incredible property for, uh, as a neutron for, for agriculture. And water, one electron more again, essential to life and to pantry. Only one electron left, completely different property. Of course, we know now from Lewis the reason for that. We know that the way to, to, to put electron in a molecule is essentially different and do totally determine their property, which is why, indeed, we can think now more in a more abstract way to chemistry and are moving toward this way slowly. In fact, why chemistry has such a bad kind of reputation? Chemistry has a bad reputation because when you want actually to make a transformation of, of molecules, which is the essential part of chemistry, you start from your desire, species, and you go to the end, which is wanted product, and unfortunately, unwanted product. And the unwanted product may be polluting, or maybe undesired, or maybe exactly dangerous for whatever reason. And you actually use sometimes additional uh, ingredients, which can be toxic, which can be expensive, which can be energy demand. And of course, this is therefore really bad. And you, what you would like is to avoid this unwanted product and to prevent all of those bad uh, side effects. So in fact, from chemistry, if you were to try to find the way to do things in an absolutely proper manner, non-toxic, Fully, uh, fully, uh, only one product, absolutely nothing left, no solvent, nothing. This is extremely difficult. And in fact, all of the experiments and all of the studies through the world show that it requires a lot, a lot of, um, of experiments. However, uh, chemists do not uh, give up. And I found that I want to stress out this incredible story of artemisinin. Artemisinin is actually a drug which is essential to cure malaria. This is the only efficient drug against malaria. However, artemisinin is extracted in an extremely inefficient manner from Artemisia annua, a Chinese medicine, and that was discovered by Tu Yu Yu. He got the Nobel Prize of 2015 for this. Therefore, if you want to cure all of the people who actually suffer from this disease, you have to use chemical synthesis. However, this is a difficult molecule to make. In particular, the two oxygen there are extremely challenging to add in a specific manner to this molecule. I am very proud to announce that two of my friends, actually Martin Polyakov and Mike George in the UK, recently produced a way to make this specifically in the absolutely optimal manner using only light oxygen and in supercritical CO2, producing an absolutely uh, ideal set because you have no polluting solvent and you have only light and CO2 to actually uh, and oxygen as reactor. So one way actually to think about and improve chemistry is say, well, can you actually do something called in silico chemistry? which is actually can you use the fact that electron can be actually studied by quantum mechanics to understand their behavior and therefore improve all of the, uh, all of the process. This is indeed what has been indeed tried, but there is a problem. There is many, 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 many electrons in any molecules. And as you know, the solving the Schrodinger equation becomes harder and harder when you have a lot of electrons. Therefore, this can, be look, this can be very, very difficult. And you may wonder how actually accurate is the solution. What help can you get from a wrong number? 
So are you actually, do, do, are you distressed, worried, lost, or actually are you waiting for the solution and waiting forever? No, in fact, you don't need to wait forever. And I want to point out the incredible, uh, I would say, input given by one of the Nobel Prize winners who actually is very well known in this country, Paul Hoffman. He actually proposed that there was no need for actually accurate number. You can analyze the bonding and you can actually look at the wave function associated with this electron <coughs> and understand chemistry even if you do not calculate properly. And he saw a set of reactions which were actually at that time known as reaction without mechanism, which is of course not possible, but they could not be interpreted with the classical rule of chemistry. So with that in mind, people, actually chemists, would like to solve real problems and be as useful as possible to the world. So one, I, there is so many now study of chemistry that I have to decide and extract one out of billion and billion and billion. So I show the fact that everybody is worried about CO2. And everybody is, wor is worried about CO2 and would like actually to make useful species out of CO2. What can you make a useful species? You can make methanol, which is of course very important, or you can make intermediate species, which are called ester, which are food odor, essential oil, pheromone, polyester, or amide, which are medicine, <coughs> or even LSD if you use it wrongly. So can you do that? Yes. Can you do that from something as simple as dihydrogen, a very, very inert molecule? Well, you can do that if you actually transform this dihydrogen into something which is an active dihydrogen. You do that with a catalyst. Several catalysts are known, expensive one or inexpensive one. Expensive one because they use ruthenium, expen less expensive one because they use iron. And this whole study has been actually the result of a study of several laboratories in US and in France and in, in Oslo and in Spain, trying actually to find the best way to start from CO2, use only hydrogen as a reactant in the proper solvent and catalyst, combining experiment and computation chemistry in order to find the best way to go from start to the end. With this in mind, let's look actually at, the, at what, is the, what is actually the state of affairs. Today in silico chemistry, means actually in computer chemistry, is evolving very, very fast. And today computer data can be compared really to experimental results which means that they can really dialogue with experimental chemists and actually compare data and therefore propose interpretation. It's e actually the methods are even evolving faster. So I would say in the, in the near future, we actually are going to be even better on representing various electronic states, the statistics, the environment, actually solving more and more and more complex. We always start with rather non-complex system and we end up by looking at extremely challenging species which may differ by only a few kilocalories, a few minute amount of energy and being able how to directly go there or interpret the physical properties. So there is indeed a way for chemists and uh, experimental and computational chemists to get together and there is a long and also to understand reaction better. So whether we like it or not, chemistry is part of our life. There is no doubt about it. It is, it's absolutely, it is an essential key to understand the nature of the transformation, whether it is for inert molecule or non-inert, that is actually bio system. I do believe there is indeed a lot of chemistry in biology system, and they are very difficult to understand. And we are actually a, uh, an essential partner for all of the, all of the science. We have seen art, we have seen food, and there are many others. Chemistry can be friendly and can be sustainable if you actually pursue that goal, and I am absolutely sure all chemists have that goal. And chemistry is not only a problem, it's only a solution. Chemistry is fun. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for leading us through this significant and important world. And before you go, you have the last chance. Over there. Hi, thank you for the wonderful talk. Now let's have a very brief break. Stay here, Odile. We shall let the young generation now depart with our thanks and gratitude for being with us. Yeah, you have no question. Let me tell you, uh, we, we had wonderful lectures all, all this afternoon, really excellent lectures. The last lecture is uh, by, by our friend, uh, a member of the Academy, Professor Kirkenstein, who is an archaeologist. So it's a little variation. It's part of the humanity. And if you can stay, Please, is a wonderful lecture. But if you have to depart because uh, the bus is waiting for you, so you don't have any other choice, but you'll miss the last wonderful lecture. I would suggest invite Professor Finkelstein. He will be very happy to come. So do whatever is convenient. And now questions to... As a Representative Our of the younger generation, I'd like speaker. to ask you a question. Yeah, yeah. So you um, presented the fact that uh, the, these uh, approximations to the perfect quantum mechanical uh, equations uh, that describe these materials give you uh, good results. How perfect. But in fact, how much do you now think about it? When you do an experiment, what do you want to do? You do you want to do a calculation for getting a number, or you want to do a calculation for understanding nature? Nature is associated with a certain degree of uncertitude around any data. So an uh, exact number will be maybe of interest in a very abstract manner, but it will even if it is rich, it doesn't give you any more information than a less difficult number to reach which indeed reproduce all of the physical and the chemical aspect of it. So the absolute number, or we are getting closer and closer and closer to, a, to the precise number for very small, diatomic and so forth. We will never get it for species which are very, of, of the number of atoms, which are of interest, I would say, to many chemists. So we can get something like, I would say, for, a molecule for physicists. And that's important for astrophysics, for instance, and astrochemistry. No, you, you, I mean, yes, you, you, you will be able to, I mean, you know it for H, for H, and that's it. And after that, it will be always there with not exact number. This, I mean, how many digits? This do might you want? change in like the next 10 years. Excuse me? This might change in the next 10 years, and this relates to a stuff that uh, Professor Cohen Tanuji was talking about, but that's another story. And you know, if I will add to the very perceptive comment made by our speaker, it depends what questions you want to ask, and what about nature do you want to learn from your calculation? Exactly. If you are actually after trying to find a spectra, of a molecule you want to detect in space, highest, the highest possible accuracy is needed in order to identify the system. If you actually want to know why a given uh, reaction occurs this way or this way, much less accuracy is known. If you want to actually uh, study uh, semiconductor or conductor and so forth, maybe more of a different nature, uh, um, Accuracy of different nature is known. So difference between state, difference between two states and not absolute energy of each state. So it's really the question is at the art of doing computation chemistry for chemistry. Before our speaker gets more questions, what are the two great outstanding open questions of the chemical sciences? Oh, wow. Okay, uh, two, the two only, that's, uh, 
I, w- I would say re- right now, uh, uh, typically, will you be able to predict a reaction from scratch? And, uh, and I would say, give a goal, give me the component without any knowledge. And I would say, no. And I don't think it's actually a way to go because we, we have accumulated inform- knowledge and we should never neglect that. I would say otherwise, yes, compute or try to compute more and more and more complex systems of larger and larger systems which approach bio, bio, mm-hmm. biochemistry, membranes and so forth. At the, at the end of it, compute a human being. I'm not sure this is really needed, but this will be a goal which will be, I would say, rather uninteresting. Now, these are very important goals. I would say that the two big open questions in chemistry are the secrets of life. We had about yeah, beautiful progress from Professor Yana and the chemical universe. How what happens outside our realm of living? Yeah, I would say I don't think computation will give the role what is actually what makes what makes suddenly an inert system lively. That's no, I agree. we agree on I that. I agree. I agree with you.